Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit wpsu.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at wpsu.org slash shop. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Nuclear Energy Lessons from Japan. I'm Patty Satalia. The devastating earthquake and tsunami that thrust Japan into a nuclear crisis also opened a Pandora's box of questions. With 104 nuclear power plants currently operating in the U.S., experts and civilians alike are forced to consider how safe is nuclear energy? Is it worth the risk? What does the future hold? Our panel of Penn State experts will answer those questions and yours during tonight's live call-in program. Program. Now let's meet our guest. Arthur Mata is a nuclear engineer and chair of the nuclear engineering program at Penn State. Chuck Amon is an earthquake seismologist and professor of geosciences at Penn State. James Freihout is an architectural engineer and director of technology and operations for the Department of Energy's innovation hub at the Greater Philadelphia Navy Yard, where researchers are focused on creating more efficient, energy efficient buildings. And Yuka, uh, Yumiko uh, Watanabe is a research associate in geosciences sciences at Penn State and a survivor of Japan's March 11th earthquake and tsunami. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, the whole world, as you know, is reacting uh, to Japan's natural and, and nuclear disaster. And I'd like to begin the hour by getting each of you to react to the disaster from your own unique perspectives as a nuclear engineer, a seismologist, an architectural uh, engineer, and as a, an eyewitness. And I'll begin with you, Dr. Mata. Oh, thank you. Uh, the, this earth, this uh, disaster was uh, on a scale much bigger than the Three Mile Island, and uh, it was uh, something that uh, was much beyond the design basis of the accident of the accidents that were pre predicted for this reactor. The uh, reactor so far has uh, has protected the public, which is all that you can expect in such big accidents, uh, and. Uh, but if we end up with uh, something that ends up scrapping the reactors, I think this would be a good outcome. But it's a uh, it's test moments for all of us. Dr. Ramon? Uh, from a seismologist perspective, this is a very large earthquake. Uh, in a region that we expected some large earthquakes, but nothing this large, what an earthquake of this size does is generate a larger tsunami than is expected and devastates a much broader region than, say, a, a, even a great magnitude 8 earthquake, which those are the kinds of earthquakes we expected in this region. We'll follow up on that later. Dr. Freihant. Well, from a demand perspective, we're trying to create energy efficient buildings, which means we're trying to lower the carbon footprint of buildings and lower the amount of primary energy used in buildings. Uh, nuclear energy seems to be a way of delivering electricity to buildings. 70% of all electricity in this country is used in building systems. And it's a carbon free, carbon uh, footprint free way of getting electricity to buildings. However, now this seems to be put in question as a, as a central source. So now we're looking at maybe smaller modular distributed systems where we might still be able to use nuclear in a different fashion. And we'll follow up on that as well. Dr. Wanatabe? Yeah, um, actually, yeah. I was so shocked to learn how that topic is big, you know, uh, that crisis is actually a big topic in the U.S. because I just came back from Japan two days ago. And uh, myself, I was very busy to survive, you know, to make everything right for my mom. Yes, yeah, so you were yeah. visiting your mother for spring break in yeah, Japan. Exactly. And, and your mother is, is okay? My mom is fine, doing okay. fine now. All right, we'll find out more about that. It, we will spend the first half hour discussing what happened in Japan, the role and safety of nuclear energy in the United States, as well as our energy future. Then we'll open up our phone lines for your questions. Our phone number is 1-800-543-8242. But first, a quick snapshot of Japan's nuclear disaster. It was the perfect storm meeting an imperfect design. And now the U.S. nuclear industry is bracing for a backlash, even as it breaks ground on what it hoped was a new era. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant almost made it through. But almost is not good enough in this business. A nuclear power plant runs on uranium-235. Pellets of the radioactive element are stacked in long zirconium rods. 
When they are clustered in just the right way, atoms begin splitting in a chain reaction called fission, which boils water, creating steam to spin huge turbine generators. When an earthquake hits, control rods that absorb neutrons automatically drop into the fuel cluster to stop the fission. That worked fine at Fukushima. But even if you do shut down the reaction, the fuel still gives off heat, a lot of heat for a very long time. And that's because when you split uranium, you generate what are called fission products. These are radioactive isotopes that decay at a rate, so they, they generate a lot of heat. And you have to worry about that heat for a long time. That's why you need to continue to provide a lot of cooling even after the reactor shuts down for some period of time, because if you don't have that cooling, the temperature can rise to the point where it will actually destroy the fuel. The water pumps are designed to keep running on power from the grid, but the earthquake knocked that out. Diesel generators are the last line of defense, but in this case, they were swamped by the tsunami. And that is the Achilles heel that turned this into the worst reactor meltdown since Chernobyl. That gives us a snapshot, and I know that was difficult for you to watch. I'm sorry that you had to, you probably can't get away from this. Um, Explain what we know. What's our current understanding about what went wrong and how soon might we have a full picture? There's no black box in, in this case. Yeah, it, it may be a while before we get a full picture of this whole thing. But what happened was that, the, uh, as, the, as the video said, the uh, control rods shut the reactor down, shut the fission reaction away. And uh, what we had to do then is to get rid of the decay heat. And uh, this decay heat is re comes from the radioactive fission products that are still decaying after the fission reaction stops. This can be substantial. It can be t something like 240 megawatts out of a 3,000 megawatt plant. It's a, a substantial amount of uh, energy. So it has to be forced cooling, which has to run on pumps. And those, in those accidents, it is assumed that you lose off-site power, so you, you run on backup generators, which worked fine in this plant until the tsunami hit. Well, the interesting thing about the backup is that all four generators were in the same place, which doesn't sound like very good. Uh, they're, they're talking about redundancy here, and that doesn't didn't sound like a very redundant yeah, plan. Yeah, they, they, they underwent a common cause failure, which uh, I guess they did not expect that a tsunami that big would hit them, but that's what, what actually happened. So when that happened, then they were without power, and they, the, uh, the reactor started to uh, heat up. So two things happened. You have uh, increase in temperature, increase in pressure. The pressure then has to be vented to the containment building, and uh, the temperature also causes the corrosion reaction between the water and the fuel rods to increase. And that, that corrosion reaction generates hydrogen, which when you vent, then created a uh, combustible mixture in the, uh, in the containment building, or in the secondary containment building, I should, I should say. We should, there's a graphic there that we can maybe see that uh, uh, shows a little bit the, the design of the plant and the containment barriers that we have. Maybe I should, I'm not sure if we can go to, those, to that graphic. But anyway, there was a, there is a, a pressure vessel that contains the fuel rods. And you can see it there. That's the uh, brown thing in the middle is a pressure vessel. The yellow uh, sort of a skirt around it is the primary containment for the Mark I. And the, it's indicated up top there. You also see the spent fuel pool. This is because the fuel has to be kept underwater. It's just kept you know, out of the reactor. So the, the spent fuel pool has to be high like that. This is one of the design problems that they talked about, that they, the spent fuel is so high is more susceptible to earthquakes. We should mention that this particular uh, nuclear reactor is 40 years old. Right. How different are reactors that are coming online? and, and This is a G type reactor, a boiling water reactor, and the, the, this, uh, this design has been changed, and the newer reactors are not like that. They have, the, they have different spent fuel pools. But the, this hydrogen explosion that occurred that blew the top of the reactor uh, building, but it did not affect the actual containment because the fission products are still held inside the pressure vessel and inside the containment, which means that this is a lot more like TMI in which the core melted down but uh, essentially got contained inside the pressure vessel rather than Chernobyl where the core of the reactor was exposed to the air and building out spoke catching fire. So really uh, Chernobyl is a two orders of magnitude or several orders of magnitude higher and this one is, is worse than TMI, but you know, in the same order of magnitude as TMI. But you could probably say that one common denominator is uh, human error. I'm not sure that human error occurred in this case, except maybe in faulty design, maybe. Uh, although, it's, uh, it, it, you know, when you, when you have these very large events, and, and Chuck can comment on this a little bit more, what kind of earthquakes you should design to, some limit has to be reached. We have to, cannot design beyond that. And you design for a limit, and in that limit, the plant should survive intact. 
If it goes beyond that limit, what you want is for the plant to fulfill its basic mission, which is to protect the public from radioactive release. So far, it has done that. And, but the call has been a lot closer than what I would have liked it to be. That, that brings up an interesting point, and that is that uh, that earthquakes are of a magnitude, uh, or actually natural disasters are uh, coming in unprecedented strength these days. Have we seen the, the top of what an earthquake can be? Um, well, this earthquake is one of the largest that we've seen. It's one of the top, top five, five. But it, it's not the largest. In 1960, there was a magnitude 9.5, which is substantially larger than this in southern Chile. And in 1964, in Alaska, there was an, another earthquake, similar type in a subduction zone environment, that produced a 9.2, again, larger than this earthquake. So we've seen these size before, but fortunately, they're very, very rare. Very, very rare, but what does that mean in terms of citing a, um, a nuclear reactor? Well, again, I, I think the, the point here is the reactor worked as it was supposed to for the shaking. It shut down. Uh, it was the backup system for power that got taken out by the tsunami. So that is something that you know, we should look at in terms of uh, you know, changing that, that part of the design. But overall, the system seemed to work. It handled an earthquake that was much larger than they had expected in that part of Japan. Support for nuclear power was at an all-time high prior to this, uh, to this uh, devastating accident. 62% of Americans favored it, uh, but post-Fukushima, uh, uh, the polls show that Americans are once again wary of it. 44% are in favor. And I'm wondering how, Dr. Wanatabe, has your own attitude toward nuclear power, if at all, changed? Yeah, because, you know, uh, we don't have resources in Japan. so. You know, we need something, you know, instead of the, you know, coal or natural gas, you know. So people try to accept, I think, the nuclear power plant. But uh, another history, we, unique history we Japanese has is a, you know, nuclear bomb. So some people has a very strong allergy for the nuclear power. When you got word that, that there was an earthquake yeah. and a tsunami, how quickly did the idea that you're also within miles of a nuclear power plant, how, how quickly did that thought come uh, to mind? Because of my hometown is Sendai. We have an, another nuclear plant near Sendai, and that's Onagawa. So I, I actually think about that, you know, anything happened to the nu nuclear plant. I worried about it. But, uh, uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, electrical power, so we didn't have uh, actually information, you know, until... Because uh, you lost power uh, in, in yeah, your home. Yeah, we lost the power. So I just hear the radio. So I couldn't figure out what's actually going on uh -huh. until the third day after the earthquake. I want to talk a little bit about whether or not this will be a game changer. After the, the BP uh, oil disaster and the Macy mining disaster, many people said that, that the debate about uh, those uh, sources of energy would change. Uh, they're saying the same thing about nuclear energy. And I'm wondering, in your opinion, uh, Dr. Freihout, is this a game changer? Well, I think you got to put this in the context of the overall concern for uh, global warming and climate and carbon-based fuels. From a building engineer, architectural engineering perspective, uh, we look and we say, look, we use 40 percent of all the primary energy in this country operating buildings uh, in one form or another, either natural gas, oil, or electricity from the grid. Seventy percent of all of our electricity is produced, uh, produced goes into buildings. So we're looking at ways of lowering the carbon footprint of building and also decreasing our dependence on all forms of fossil fuels. So nuclear appeared to be emerging as a way of reducing the carbon footprint of buildings, but um, also supplying increased energy needs as we grow, as our economy grows. Now this has put a little uh, you know crimped in the the uh, the risk factor, and more importantly, maybe the risk factor relative to financing. You know, central large nuclear power plants require a great deal of financing. Ten billion dollars to yeah. build a new nuclear reactor yeah. No today. single utility can afford that. Uh, no group of utilities can afford that, which is you found President Obama trying to spur this forward uh, by guaranteeing the loans and guaranteeing the insurance for the 
for the power plants. Now it looks like that may not be feasible for large plants. I do think it's worth looking at small modular reactors that can really distribute the production of electricity in districts and also use the waste heat from those reactors immediately in those districts for cooling and heating. We do the same thing with combustion systems and they greatly reduce the carbon footprint of the buildings while increasing the overall efficiency of the buildings. The small modular reactors you're talking about, I want to follow up with you, Dr. Mata, in a moment, but the carbon emissions reductions that you're talking about as a result of nuclear power, experts say we won't see those reductions until 2030 at the earliest. Now, of course, with wind power, you'd see those reductions, uh, or solar power, you'd see them immediately. Well, it depends on how you do the calculation for wind and solar. If you do the total life cycle carbon analysis, including the energy it requires to make these systems and to provide the storage systems so that they can actually be used on a 24-hour basis, you get a whole different set of numbers for the carbon efficiency of solar and wind. So um, if you compare that to an on-site fossil fuel based like natural gas based system where you can generate electricity reasonably efficiently, collect the heat for cooling and heating, you get an overall fuel efficiency use of 70, 80 percent. Compared to a central power plant uh, or a central distribution system, you're talking over only about a 30, 35 percent efficiency. So distributed systems from my perspective, from an architectural engineering perspective, give you an overall advantage in fuel usage efficiency and carbon footprint reduction. There are actually three uh, Department of Energy innovation hubs. One is working on solar energy, another is working on nuclear power, and mm. the third, which, which you're uh, working on, is on uh, energy efficient buildings. Correct. How soon what you're working on will it make it to the marketplace? Well, we have a goal to have a market impact in the Philadelphia region. It's a regionally based cluster because of the regional difficulties in terms of implementing a transformation in the building industry uh, due to regional public policies, economic drivers, cost of energies, et cetera. But our goal is in five years, we should see an impact on the uh, building industry in the Philadelphia region, uh, meaning new job categories are created, new job opportunities are created, and new companies are actually are formed to do uh, buildings from a systems perspective. And then national standards changing in, in how we build it or, or regional changes based on climate and, and, uh, and other things? Regional changes in, in the Philadelphia area that can be transferred to other regions with the appropriate modifications and then leading to national requirements and national policies that support really truly measured energy efficiency in buildings. We don't have that now. Okay. Do, do you think that this event is going to be a game changer for nuclear energy? You know, I've been asked this question many times to every interviewer that has, and I've had many this last week, uh, have asked me this question, and I really haven't focused on that very much. I think it's too early to tell. I'm sure it will affect it, and it will not affect it in a positive manner. Uh, I wanted to just go back. I mean, I think I agree with uh, Jim that the, uh, one of the questions about uh, nuclear energy is the cost. And nuclear energy is something that has a lot of upfront costs. And the upfront costs have to do with borrowing the money, and then having to uh, pay interest on that money while the plant is being built. And sometimes these plants drag it on for a long time, which increase the cost. And sometimes they're abandoned. Right. So, uh, but if you, so if you delay the cost enough, you have more and more interest, which increases the cost of the plant. Once they're built, they are cash cows. They are, they are the lowest cost generators in the market, you know, competing with coal. And so in the sense, uh, there is there's this Part, and you know how how long can you operate a nuclear power plant? Forty years, sixty years. You know when we first started uh, creating nuclear power plant fifty years ago, we made licenses for forty years. We're extending now them for sixty years and longer, and we're going to have to look at those things later. But uh, you know if you can, as long as you can keep on operating those plants, you can operate, and the the, the fuel costs are very low. But so. the real problem is that we still have not figured out a, a permanent solution. Uh, for uh, disposing of, of spent fuel. Yeah. yeah, so the disposal of the spent fuel, this is actually a course that I teach at Penn, at Penn State, uh, Disposal of Radioactive Waste. Uh, what you, and I think uh, uh, people have talked about the, the greatest amount, you know, the, the great amount of uh, tonnage that is accumulating 700,000 tons, right? Yes, and 70,000. 70,000. 70,000 and, and 2,200 uh, right. so additional if you, tons if each you, year. Uh, you, you have to think that uranium is very heavy. Now, if you take now, 20% of our electricity comes from nuclear, okay, right now, and it's about been about the same for the last 40 years or so. 
you take the, all the fuel that has been generated during that time and the volume of that, if you put it on beaver field, it would cover beaver field to a height of one to two meters. So it's very compact. One fuel rod, say about this big around and four meters tall, has the energy equivalent of a train of coal. So it's a very compact energy source, and, and it's very deadly as well. If you walk into that beaver field that I just talked about, <laughs> you would get, a, 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 you know, even a very, very fast re, 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 uh, receiver, you would be getting a lethal dose in one second, okay? So you would, um, what, but what you can do is to keep that away from people, isolate it, and contain it. And what you were going to do was put it in the desert, bury it, in a, in, a, in a separate containment place where there's little water to come in, and water is the only really credible mechanism for getting the waste out. And if there's no water, the waste basically just stays there. The predicted times that it would stay there is millions of years. By that time, the radioactivity of the waste is lower than that of the natural uranium that you mine from the soil in the first place. So it's really less of a, of a technical problem than more of a political problem in what, whether you want to actually go ahead with Yucca Mountain or not. Let's talk about Yucca Mountain from a geological standpoint. Is it a suitable place for storing permanently uh, nuclear waste? Well, that's a, a question that people tried to answer for decades. decades. <laughs> and, you know, it, I think at this point it's moot. It's been withdrawn as one of the sites. So, you know, to discuss it further, I, I, I don't see that point. But, but we have to yeah. find another site then. Is right. It, Okay, are there, are there places that, that you as a, as a seismologist would recommend would be suitable? Uh, I don't really have the solution to that. I think that's a very difficult question, and it's both a political, scientific, engineering question. Uh, so it's, it's something we have to deal with if we're going to use this as a power source. But the answer isn't sitting on the table, or I don't have the answer right here myself. How do you respond to people who say, uh, in response to what happened in Japan, that in some ways the United States is more vulnerable, that there are in, in particular certain plants that are extremely vulnerable? Vulnerable in, in the sense of natural disasters? Yes. Uh, well, I, you know, first I'd ask what the precise evidence or the exact evidence for that is. And it's more vulnerable than Japanese plants? I, I, you know, it's kind of a vague statement to start with, so I'm not sure where to begin to respond to it. Okay, well, let's even begin uh, by looking at a list that was prepared, and lots of people are seeing this in news magazines from the Daily Beast, the top 10 most vulnerable uh, nuclear power plants in the United States. And, and the first one is in, in New York, uh, along near the uh, Hudson River, um, Indian Point. Two okay. faults, apparently, run near that particular uh, okay. nuclear reactor. Earthquakes in the entire eastern and central United States are actually fairly rare. So uh, while there is some risk or some hazard there associated with the earthquakes, I think that the reason that Indian Point is on this, this chart is that the risk, you know, there's a difference between hazard and risk. The hazard is the, um, the, you know, the likelihood that there might be a natural disaster. That's the hazard. The risk is what your vulnerability is to a hazard if or, or disaster if it occurs there. So this is a this map, as far as I know, is a combination of both what's the hazard as well as the risk associated. So Indian Point is close to a very large population. Center. Twenty million people in a New that York City. That makes its risk very high. But the hazard in that region is generally relative low, relatively low with response to, to earthquakes. Of course, the other thing the Daily Beast looked at was the safety records of, of these nuclear power plants. What's your reaction to this list that people all around the country are reading, the top 10 lists? Two of them happen to be in Pennsylvania. Number three is Limerick uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, and, and a, th a third one, and I can't think of which one that is, but wh what do you think of the list? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, as we discussed... Peach bit, Bottom. Yeah, Peach Bottom. Okay. <laughs> as, we, as we discussed before the program, I really don't know where the list comes from. Uh, you have to think about risk in terms of uh, comparison to other things. And um, let's say that we take a look at the alternatives, you know, natural gas uh, or coal. And I remember a few years back, there was a big natural gas pipeline explosion through New Jersey that uh, destroyed the whole neighborhood. Now, these things don't stay in the public's mind very much, uh, but they are risks that you get from using that power source. Um, uh, if you rank the 
the vulnerabilities, I guess you would have you would come up with some ranking that some would be higher than others according to some criteria, but I don't know which criteria were used by the Daily Beast. Hmm. Can we talk about predicting uh, earthquakes? Um, how well can seismologists predict earthquakes? I, I read that we know that sometime, or the prediction is with 67% certainty, that sometime within the next 30 years there will be an earthquake near San Francisco. Uh, well, that that's based, so broad. It, yeah, <laughs> it is very broad, and it's broad purposely because there, you know, no one can predict the exact time and place of any earthquakes. So that's just the problem that we can't solve. What we try to do, and particularly in light of this discussion, is to forecast what might be the largest earthquake over a certain time interval in a particular region. Now, in the, the potential case of the San Francisco Bay Area, in the late 18, mid to eight, late 1800s, there were some magnitude six and a half to 6.8 earthquakes that occurred in that region, and we haven't seen on those particular faults any you know, seismicity of note since. So you know, using rough ideas of how, plates, how fast plates move, you get an idea of what the likelihood of an earthquake might be in that region over a decade time scale, which is the time scale you really need if you're going to strengthen structures and plan to weather these types of disasters. If nuclear power were to disappear, how would we make up that power source, Dr. Freihelt? Well, if that were to disappear, I think the most likely makeup would be natural gas using combined cycle um, power plants where you take your natural gas and you run a large gas turbine to produce electricity and take the exhaust heat from that, uh, maybe increase its, uh, its energy by firing some more natural gas into the exhaust and generating steam and then running a big steam turbine. There are, these systems are commercially available right now. Uh, they get you 50, 60 percent even overall combined cycle efficiency of fuel to electricity. So, and it can build, be built very, very rapidly and they be, can be making money very quickly, which is why it's much easier to find a financing for them up front. Um, they don't have the life cycle maybe of a nuclear power plant, but they're fast, they're online quick, they're relatively overall uh, fuel efficient. Uh, so that would probably be the most likely way of doing it. That's on the supply side. On the demand side, uh, we just need to do something about our buildings. They haven't really increased their energy efficiency significantly over the last 40 years, even though the components have become more efficient. The building doesn't operate as a system, so it's not more efficient. And I have to hand it to the, the current administration for identifying this as a not very, uh, you know, um, sort of spectacular sort of uh, problem, but it's a very real problem. Uh, identified and they're doing something about it by trying to create these energy innovation hubs to address uh, the efficiency of our buildings. And I said, I, uh, as I said before, I'm a firm believer in more distributed power systems to more efficiently use fossil fuels uh, to generate electricity near the demand sites for the electricity and using the waste heat for heating and cooling. I think that would also be a source. I think if we went from, we're about 99% combined heat and power now to generate electricity in this country. If we actualized all the sites that could use combined heat and powers in our building, it'd be 20%. And that would delay the need for the construction of new central power plants by a significant number of years so we can sort out some of these problems. You mentioned earlier small modular reactor technology and, and, and believe that that really is the, the hope of, of mm -hmm. nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about these small modular reactors. What's different about them? Well, excuse me. <laughs> well, they are, they are smaller, so that, that's a big difference in that you don't need as much financing as you need uh, from other sources. The, the safety, uh, I think there are different concepts of, of small modular reactors. Uh, but all of the reactors that would have been built today uh, would be, have been a lot safer than those that have been 40, 50 years ago, even, even considering that those were already pretty safe. You take the, uh, the small modular reactors now and they will uh, provide sort of the, well, as Jim says, uh, local power to a local community that would be uh, e more easily to uh, be uh, put up. Uh, and that's really the driver for these small modular reactors. That's the concept that uh, will, will allow you know, nuclear power to be deployed more quickly. The last reactor built in the United States was 1996, talking 15 years ago. Do we have the capacity these days? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, 
to continue with what some are saying is And especially with, the, uh, with, the, with a lot of, the, we were expecting to get a lot of our components from Japan, and with the uh, disruption in the supply chain, it may have delayed. Certainly this will delay uh, construction of nuclear power plants in the United States, and we, we were ramping up to get to that level. But uh, uh, yeah, that's that's certainly a concern. We not only it's a question of uh, of of uh, be able to build everything, but the question of expertise because uh, the last people who have built and designed nuclear power plants have to put the bolts together have been a long time ago. Right. In fact, 65 nuclear power plants were uh, being built at the time of this uh, disaster in Japan. 40 percent of them by the Chinese, and they've put that on hold and have, have called for a, a review of their nuclear. Uh, uh, program. Yeah, well, it, a lot of countries have talked about that. Germany has talked about that as well. But Germany, for example, has 30 percent of their power from nuclear, uh, from nuclear power, 30 percent of the electricity from nuclear power. And the Swedes had something like this as well. They, uh, they have, you know, a sizable fraction of the electricity from nuclear power. They had a referendum in 1990 something to close down nuclear power plants. They went around the block a couple of times trying to figure out what they're going to do, and they figure out well, let's, let's keep them operating for a little bit while I, longer. So it's not an easy problem. Every energy source has its consequences. And in the case of the Swedes, they were trying to abide by the Kyoto Agreement. And with that, it's very hard to come up with anything else that would not do that. But is it responsible to move forward without a permanent storage uh, solution? I think that's the, the, the $64,000 <laughs> question. Well, we have right now uh, 104 nuclear power plants in this country. More uh, than any other country in the world. Yes, uh, and in terms of numbers, that's the number, the largest number. In terms of percentage, there are countries that are have higher than ours. Um, so, to move forward without uh, a right waste disposal, uh, it's I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a question that uh, is more political than technical. As I said, uh, whether we want to to hold off building nuclear power plants until we have, have figured out what we're going to do with the waste, the waste can stay in storage, uh, in, in, in this semi-permanent storage for a long time. And if we wait for, say, 100 years to put the waste away for a final disposal, it will be a lot cooler by then because this decay heat decays exponentially with time. So there will be less of a heat load, less of a temperature rise in the repository when we put it in because the heat load will be, will, will be smaller. The other thing that you may want to consider is whether you want to use this waste that, that you call now waste as a resource and uh, reprocess this fuel to make more fuel for the future. For now we haven't done that because the price of uranium has been so low that it hasn't been really a, an economical thing to do. Uh, so if we... But are they if, safe in the containment facilities? Well, uh, that's, where, the, where that's, that's, that's the, the question that they're trying to answer right now. If, I, if you asked me this question two weeks ago, I'd say absolutely, because they are in the spent fuel pool, and all you have to do is to keep them underwater, right? So that's easy enough to said, right? You, you say, well, I have, a, I have a pool. All I have to do is hook up a hose, and if there's any leak, I just fill up with water, and that's not a problem. Clearly, this, this design of the spent fuel pool way out there and whether there was damage in the quake, whether there was uh, a, a loss of, of, of uh, cooling power, all these things have to be looked at again. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the case, it's not a, a very technically difficult problem to solve in the sense of cooling them for a while. After a while, they can actually be put into dry cask storage by the time that they're cool enough that they can be cooled by just natural convection of air and that takes something like 10 years. At that point, they can be put just on a concrete pad uh, with, a, with a container around it, and then just the air will, is enough to not allow the temperature to rise very much. All right. If you are just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Nuclear Energy, Lessons Learned from Japan. We'll be opening our phone lines in just a moment, so uh, let me reintroduce our guest. Arthur Mata is a nuclear engineer and chair of the Nuclear Engineering Program at Penn State. Chuck Amon is an earthquake seismologist and professor of geosciences at Penn State. Uh, James Freihout is an architectural engineer and director of technology and operations for the Greater Philadelphia Innovation Cluster, or GPIC, which is a, a DOE 
E Innovation Hub, which focuses on creating more energy efficient buildings. And uh, Yomiko Watanabe is an, uh, uh, a research associate in geosciences at Penn State and a survivor of Japan's 9.0 magnitude earthquake and tsunami. Our telephone number is 1 800 543 8242, and our panelists are ready for your first phone call. Uh, before we get that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, earthquakes. Um, one earthquake can, can uh, influence whether another one happens. What, what do you think is going to happen in Japan? Oh, that's an that's a interesting question, and it is hard to predict. There will be aftershocks, and there have been hundreds of aftershocks since the large earthquake. Uh, one of the things that seismologists are trying to do right now is figure out exactly what happened, how the plates moved during the large earthquake, and how that may affect adjacent faults, whether it loads some faults and makes failure more likely on those, or actually relieves some of the stress on some of those other faults. That's something that we're working on now. There's, you know, we don't know the answer, but we're working on it. And lots of people wonder, why was this nuclear reactor built uh, on a fault line? Um, and, and I think the, the reality is, is that there are fault lines throughout Japan. Yeah, Japan is, is uh, an, a set of islands that are surrounded by plate boundaries, and in fact, the one runs right through the middle of Honshu. The earthquake that occurred was actually some distance from the nuclear reactor. It was out beneath the sea to the east of Japan, uh, where the Pacific plate, the Pacific tectonic plate, is subducting beneath part of the North American plate, which makes up the northeastern part of Honshu. So, yes, it, it's hard to get away from faults in Japan, and that's just, you know, a fact. Uh, another fact is that the, the pull of the sun and the moon can initiate earthquakes. Talk a little bit about whether uh, drilling, because I think lots of people in Pennsylvania are concerned with the massive uh, Marcellus shale drilling, that that could cause an earthquake. Is well, that first? I'd go back to the the fact that the tides can initiate earthquakes. That's not totally clear. Now the tides do deform uh, the land as well as uh, changing the level of the oceans near the coasts. And they can, at times, trigger earthquakes. But there's many times when there's very high <laughs> solid earth tides when there's no earthquakes. So it's not a guaranteed trigger. In terms of drilling, there is a, you know, some evidence that uh, pumping water back into the ground can uh, produce small earthquakes. Uh, there's an investigation going on right now in Arkansas to determine whether that was going on. They had a magnitude 4.7 uh, several weeks ago. And they were having a lot of little earthquakes before that. Uh, so they're actually stopping the pumping to see and watch to see if that was triggering the earthquakes. But these are a whole, a much smaller class of earthquakes than what we're talking about here in Japan. My guess, uh, Yumika, is that you have experienced earthquakes yeah. in Japan before. Yeah. Yes, I did. You know, we have a very big earthquake. It's amount to the seven point something, thirty years ago. So. In my life, this is the second time. The second time. Uh, the real big earthquake. Actually, two, um, the two days ago, on the 9th, we had a quite large earthquake. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that magnitude is maybe 7.9 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, at that time, we are safe, you know. It, for instance, in my house, no furniture fell down, you know, it's stunned. But uh, just, uh, you know, one more the magnitude of differences create the big, big difference. And tell us quickly how your, how your mother is doing. Is, is she still in her home? As, uh, you know, and she's in Sendai. Yeah, actually, she, my mom has her own her house. But uh, that one house was slightly damaged by earthquake. So I suggested her to move in to my condo that's more close to the center of the city and much safer. And do you know how she's doing? Is, is she yeah, every day, food yeah, and you know, water? After I came back here, I called her and find out she's okay. Okay, all right. We go to our first phone call. Leon from State College is on the line. Leon, what's your question, please? Well, I have a statement as well as a, a comment about one of the uh, comments that somebody made and then a question. Okay. I believe James had made the comment that in describing the uh, the cycle for development of the solar and wind, he talked about making the equipment and then till it, it finished off. 
Uh, but when he referred to nuclear, he referred, referred mainly to the power plant. Mm -hmm. He neglected to talk about the full cycle, which is from the mining, the using of the power plant, and then the disposing of the uh, radioactive material until it was completely safe, which, as you, someone said before, would take many, many thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So I think he was being uh, ingracious in making that comparison. But my question is more to Arthur, and it has to do with he had said that our reactors are basically safe. And if that's the case, why is the government supporting the Price-Anderson Act? Why don't they uh, stop the Price-Anderson Act, which in effect, in a capitalist society, puts a cap on the financial responsibilities of each individual nuclear power plant? It will wind up that the government will be, paid, will be paying for accidents that are higher than the cap is. And if I said we are safe, then we shouldn't be doing this. And he should be working for the demise of the Price-Anderson Act. Thank if you, you. Thank you. Begin by, by explaining to our viewers what the Price-Anderson Act is. So this is a guarantee of, um, of the insurance that uh, uh, nuclear power plants have to have, that insurers would not be willing to insure it to a certain level. And uh, the government has stepped in and said anything above a certain level we will, we will cover. I think this comes from, and, and this is a very good question, uh, the, the, the question is uh, if it's safe, why do we need it? And why would the, uh, the insurers not just want to cover a nuclear power plant in, like a, in, a, in a free market society? And I think we have to think that uh, nuclear power uh, is only 50 years old. We don't know, uh, it is not as familiar to us as other energy sources like coal, like uh, hydropower, uh, and we don't feel like we understand uh, the risks as well. And I think this is why the, and, and I can't sp speak for the insurers, but I think this is why the insurers uh, decided not to uh, insure nuclear power, and this is why the, the government had to step in in order to, that these, uh, that these plans could be made. Uh, Relative to the carbon cycle calculation, uh, uh, the reader, uh, the caller was sort of correct in the sense that uh, I was emphasizing the fact that we don't take into account the true carbon footprint of solar and, and wind. And the reason why I did that is because when we do carbon footprinting of buildings in terms of their electric power use, we actually do account for the energy that goes into mining the coal, delivering the coal to the power plant, and the actual inefficiencies in the combustion and transmission distribution system. Do the same thing for the nuclear energy. But the calculations for solar and wind and hydro don't include those, and my point is they should be included. Okay. Uh you compared uh, Chernobyl a moment ago uh, to, uh, you, you compared the disaster in Japan with Chernobyl and with, uh, with TMI. Talk a little bit, if you would, Dr. Motto, um, about what you think the, the health impact of this particular accident will be. Oh, it's very hard to speculate at this point because you don't know what kind of releases we have had. We don't know what kind of exposures they have resulted into. Uh, releases are one thing. We don't know if, and, and the form that the release takes in, whether it's airborne, whether it, it's contained on, on the site, whether it's not. So it's very hard to speculate. The, the measurements that have been done at the boundary of the site uh, do not indicate very high levels, uh, levels that would be much above the natural background. So just to give you an idea of the variation in natural background, uh, in my home country in Brazil, there's a beach called uh, Guarapari where the, the, uh, there are some monazite sands where the exposures there are very high. And uh, I mean, compared to natural here, background here. And, and here we have Denver. Well, that's right. Denver would be higher because you have less atmosphere on top and, and therefore you have more exposed to cosmic rays. So uh, the variability in the natural background is very large and we haven't been able to correlate cancer to, uh, to living in those places. So at the, the doses that have been reported so far would be within that natural background variation, but uh, I would hesitate to say because I don't know how much exposure has, will actually result from this, especially to the workers in the plant, because some workers have actually received reasonably high doses. There was reports of one re worker receiving a 10 rem dose, uh, which is much higher than what you'd normally, uh, this is about twice the allowed amount that the NRC allows in a year.
I want to get back to uh, to earthquakes for a moment because I think seismologists, people around the world, were were surprised by by the magnitude of this uh, uh, earthquake in in Japan. Um, is the frequency uh, of earthquakes increasing? And I, and I ask that because lots of people read today that Laos had a had an earthquake of 6.8 magnitude today. Right in in the near the border of Myanmar and, and Laos. Uh, it, when you ask that question, you have to ask, ask, well, what size earthquakes are they increasing? If you look at all the earthquakes with magnitude 7 and larger and compare the statistics or the numbers for the last 50 to 60 years or even 100 years, it's more or less level and it's not increasing. But, you know, I think from natural fluctuations, you also see, you know, some, an increase in, largest, in the largest earthquakes in the last 30 years or so. Uh, there was a lull, actually, in the mid... 80s to mid 90s in the number of great earthquakes, earthquakes with magnitudes greater than eight. And the number has been increasing, the number of those has been increasing steadily uh, since the mid 90s. So we're having more and more. And there's a, a you know, it's still interesting, but there's a, a, an apparent increase since the 2004 Sumatra earthquake in the amount of energy being released seismically. But these things, if you look historically, or you compare it with random simulations. These could be perfectly natural fluctuations uh, in Earth's behavior. What kinds of changes are you seeing with regard to floods or tornadoes or volcanoes, for example? Um, I don't, I'm, that's out of my field, but I don't know of any increases in those that, yeah. Uh, our telephone number, we have Arthur from Johnstown, but our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242. We'll go to Arthur, who is calling us from Johnstown. Go, up, uh, go ahead, please, Arthur. Thank you. I would like to ask the whole panel, uh, knowing that uh, nuclear energy seems to be the way to go for clean uh, cleanliness and so forth, is there any way that we can uh, more or less uh, make safer plants, uh, more or less uh, make them uh, more... Uh, or not prone to any kind of problems. Uh, Tell us about this new generation yeah, of reactors. Right. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the new uh, reactors are supposed to be passively safe. That is, mm -hmm. uh, people have used it, even the term walk away safe, which I don't like because it seems like you're walking away from the plant. But you know, they won't do that. But it, it's something that doesn't need uh, intervention in order to remain safe after an accident. And um, uh, they are certainly a lot safer than, than the ones before, although these, those have performed remarkably well. If you think about the, uh, the uh, we're talking about the uh, health effects of this accident, and uh, one thing that I'm pretty confident about is that the, uh, any kind of uh, health toll from, this, uh, from, uh, from the radiological releases are going to be far, far smaller than the toll from the earthquake itself. Uh, what level of disaster are U.S. reactors uh, engineered to withstand, and, and how is that determined? Well, uh, again, I'm, uh, th this is something that I'm not completely familiar with, but I would imagine that if you cite something like uh, near Diablo Canyon uh, or in San Onofre in California, which is near fault, what you would do is you would look at the uh, history of the earthquakes that have taken in that place and then design for the place that you have built the plant in. And uh, you wouldn't build uh, a plant, say, in Georgia in the same way that you would build it in California or, or the state of Washington. Um, and by the way, the, one of the, 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 the and Chuck can uh, confirm this, I, from what I understand, the faults that uh, uh, are present in California are not the type that would normally produce a tsunami. Is that correct? Uh, in the northernmost part of California, off the coast of Oregon, Washington, and southwestern Canada, there is a fault that's very similar to, to the, the one, one that just failed. But Southern California, where you're talking about Diablo Canyon, yeah. that there's nothing there that's similar. And uh, and in the case of Diablo Canyon, uh, it's built on a slightly elevated terrain, so you would normally not be subjected to this. But having said that, you can always have Katrina-type events that you have not thought about. And if you had a nuclear power plant in New Orleans, you would have been affected in some way. And as it turns out, half of the 104, <laughs> roughly half of the 104 nuclear power plants in the United States are built near faults. I is that by accident? Well, um, I guess uh, you'd have to ask uh, Chuck a little bit more yeah, about this. I mean, the way that uh, the seismic hazard is assessed for the nuclear power plants is to go to those regions and to try to estimate, well, what's the maximum size earthquake 
that you could have there and then build the plant so that it with, can, can withstand the shaking from that. Mm -hmm. So it is site specific. And those studies are reviewed every decade. They're undergoing a review right now. And so the NRC is continually assessing that as we learn more from earthquakes that occur um, everywhere around the world. So if the historical record shows that a particular area has had a, a four point magnitude uh, earthquake, would it be built then to withstand something larger than that or just a four? It, it would be built to withstand something larger than that because that's, that's not really a, a anywhere near a threatening earthquake at any level in that point. Uh, you, you also have to imagine that uh, you know, in the case where we have a nine earthquake, you have devastation on the, on the area to the, to the point that you cannot have emergency services that would normally be available uh, when there's a problem uh, that would be responding to those. So when, I, when this accident happened and I, it was Friday, I said, well, that's fine. It's going to be, they're going to be in break, backup generators. Everything is going to be fine. Uh, I, what I didn't, what I failed to account for was the, the devastation in the region and how it would affect the, able, the ability of the teams to respond to the accident. Uh, a top official with the NRC recently said that the nuclear crisis in, crisis in Japan does not warrant an immediate change in American nuclear uh, plants. Do you agree with that? Well, we can't change. We, we have the plants we have, but we will certainly look at, uh, at, the, at their uh, and and the thing, well, something, we, well, something we have not talked about very much is the spent fuel pools and what uh, what kind of risk are they under? I think we will have a lot more backup systems and a lot more uh, analysis of how they would react in the case of uh, of some kind of accident. Uh, but and we'll certainly have reviews, I'm sure, uh, of the seismic preparedness of the plants that are most uh, in the regions that are most uh, susceptible to seismic events. And, and this has been already announced by the NRC that they have this two-pronged uh, analysis approach. So we will be looking at these plants again and we'll, have, we'll try to learn from those, from those lessons. But again, if, we, if those plants survive the accident as they have without releasing uh, and, and they have to be scrapped, this is a good outcome because you have protected the public. Uh, that's all you can hope for when you have something that's much beyond the, the design basis of the accident that you plan for. What options are there for disposing of the waste that, that's there? These, these, this facility will be scrapped, um, but what happens to the spent fuel oh, rods? They will, the, something happens similar to Three Mile Island. They will, they'll be cleaned up, they will be put into canisters, and they will be put into a repository somewhere. In the case of uh, Three Mile Island, uh, it took three years or more to clean up the reactor. This will take some time, but it will be, it's a big mess that has to be cleaned up. Uh, but again, this is a good outcome because you can contain it and you can put it somewhere and it will, it will not expose anybody to, to radiological consequences. Okay, we go to Ted who's calling us from Delaware. Go ahead, please, Ted. It's Ted. Anyway, my question is this. Why are you completely ignoring the deep rock geothermal energy possibility? It's a process with this uh, this um, board by the Atomic Energy Commission in 1970 and they ran a plan for 20 years to show that it was viable. Engineers and um, MIT have looked at the process some years ago, and they found that it's quite viable. The only byproduct is slight earthquakes, as one of your speakers earlier pointed out. And uh, the only and all you get is just water, you know, two holes in the ground, water down one, steam out the other, and run the turbine. Why aren't we considering that? Deep rock technology. Can you can you respond to that? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, maybe Chuck is even better than me to do, uh, to answer that. But no. let me just <laughs> mention mention quickly that the uh, the uh, the amount of of geothermal energy uh, viable uh, regions in this country is limited. But maybe you can expand well, on that. Well, I think yeah, I think James. the uh, the problem with a lot of these technologies is look, we got to frame it in terms of if we want economic growth, we need power. If we need power, what risk do we want to put up with? The nuclear industry seems to present a spectacular risk from one reason or another. But if you look at the coal industry, we produce 50% of our electricity using coal. If you look at the integrated health effects of using coal and safety effects of using coal to produce power, you're going to dwarf the amount of health effects and deaths that have been produced by the nuclear industry. But they happen over a long they time happen, period. So they go out of people's perspective over that time. So it's how we frame the risk. It's, and then there's the financial, uh, the financial risk uh, in, uh, in the financing community in terms of deep rock. Yeah, the, you could use deep rock, but at what cost per installed kilowatt? And how ubiquitous could it be used 
at a reasonable installed cost per kilowatt. So you have all these factors going on at once and to really have an intelligent debate and discussion and policy formulation, you really have to all agree on what the constraints are going to be on that debate. Okay. Well, let's end by saying where do we go from here, Dr. Freiheld? Well, I think it's, it's time that the country, you know, we have this long-term carbon uh, uh, global climate risk that we want to deal with, and we have the near-term risk of how are we going to use our array, our potential array of power generating technologies to best serve the country for the minimum risk and a reasonable cost. And I think it's time that our country really get involved and our policymakers and leaders in a long-term debate and solution set that it can put before the American people to really decide which way they want to go with this. Dr. Wanatana, you, you know this in, in a different way than the rest of us. What are your final thoughts? Oh, it's a difficult question to me. But uh, actually, I have a question for Dr. Mata. Uh, you know, actually, in my point of view, nuclear power plant in Onagawa is much bigger, you know, or, you know, uh, hit by bigger tsunami. Why that plant, particular plant, survive and the uh, Fukushima plant damaged? Why did the plants more? survive? Yeah, so this was meant to, I mentioned before that the backup generators kept on working, and that was uh, something specific to the site. So that's okay. because of the design? Okay. Yeah. Your final thoughts? Yeah, some pe people ask what kind of energies we should be using, whether solar, wind, renewables, nuclear, coal, and whether we should use conservation. And my answer is yes, we should use all of these, and we're going to need all of these because even if we conserve energy, if we use all the efficiencies that Jim is talking about, with the, just with the population increase, we're going to need maybe 30, 40 percent more energy in 30, 40 years. Dr. Amen? Uh, I think from a seismological perspective, seismologists will keep studying earthquakes, trying to get the best information on what the hazards are in different parts of the country, different parts of the world, so that we can try to reduce our sort of exposure to these types of disasters. And could a tsunami uh, and an earthquake like the one that hit Japan help happen in other places around the world? Oh, yes. Well, there was the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean off the coast of, you know, Indonesia, Sumatra, and the Andaman Islands. And in, it turns out, off the coast of Oregon and Washington in 1700, there was an event that may have been of similar size. All right. And on that note, we're out of time. I'd like to thank our Penn State experts, Arthur Amata, a nuclear engineer and chair of the Nuclear Engineering Program, Chuck Amon, an earthquake seismologist and professor of geosciences, James Freihout, an architectural engineer and director of the Energy Innovation Hub at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and Yumika Watanabe, a research associate in geosciences and a survivor of Japan's earthquake and tsunami. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at WPSU, thank you for joining us and good night. Right.